Okay, so this is part two in my AP Bio topic 8.7, Disruptions to Ecosystems. And so here I'm actually going to skip C for right now and just briefly talk about the O in HIPCO, which stands for over-exploitation or over-harvesting. And so the key parts of this is that we are, as humans, are taking more um, individuals than can replenish naturally. And so here's an example of like over harvesting fish. And so we take a lot of fish out of our oceans. And so the death rate is greater than the birth rate. So when more fish are dying because we're taking them and eating them, than are being born, you're going to have a reduction in the population size. And if we do this by a very large difference, right? The death rate is way higher than the birth rate, then that's unsustainable and is going to result in the decline or extinction of species. Now, we also see this with our sharks. So we harvest or we take about 250,000 sharks out of our oceans per day, which is equal to about a million every four days. And so that is an unsustainable practice. And we saw that in like the Wolves of Yellowstone video, in discussion, we saw that if you take a top predator from a food web, that is going to have drastic consequences on the uh, populations in the tropic levels below. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about climate change. Climate change is also having an impact on our ecosystems. And when you really think about what climate change is, it's a warming of our atmosphere, our oceans, our land. And so that is a, like the temperature is an abiotic factor and life on earth oh i'm sorry i just want to make a note if you are interested in looking at a lot of data and um, explanations of climate change i would search nasa climate change their website is fantastic with lots of resources for you um, but really when it comes down to climate change we are increasing our global temperature and this is having an impact especially on species that are very particular for the temperature that they live in. So in like water or aquatic ecosystems, warmer water may cause disruptions in what is able to grow, uh, whether it's plankton or algae or fish. Um, it also has an impact because a lot of producer populations um, require certain abiotic factors, right? Temperature, rainfall in order to grow. And so if you're having like hotter, drier conditions, well then the producer populations are gonna struggle and this is going to lead to a decrease in like available energy for trophic levels. And so um, anyway, so let's go ahead though and talk about like what is climate change caused by? And it really comes down to greenhouse gases. And so greenhouse gases trap heat in our atmosphere so as we increase the amount of greenhouse gases, we're increasing the amount of heat that we're trapping. And this temperature, sorry, is an abiotic factor that is having consequences. And so we have actually monitored the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere uh, for the last 60 years or so um, in an observatory in uh, Hawaii. However, uh, we also can access carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere dating back nearly a million years due to ice core uh, data that we have. We can drill into the um, ice sheets in the uh, Arctic, like in Greenland or in Antarctica, and we have actually trapped ancient atmosphere. And what we can see is that the current rate of uh, warming and accumulation of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is about uh, 10 times faster than what we previously see in previous periods of global warming on planet Earth. So normally, while uh, we have experienced global warming and global cooling throughout uh, history on planet Earth, uh, it usually takes the, in a period of global warming, it usually takes about a thousand years to warm one degree Celsius. And we have done it in a hundred years. So the rate of change is what's different and that's what's causing huge disruptions to our ecosystems simply because um, the, the speed at which it's happening and which the changes are occurring uh, makes it incredibly difficult for natural selection to keep up <laughs> because natural selection relies on variation within populations but variation is created by random mutations and so i'll talk about that in a few slides um, but really when we look at climate change like i mentioned we have been monitoring the amount of carbon dioxide since 1958 and we have seen the highest amounts of carbon dioxide in the last three million years now this is going to have huge impacts on biodiversity and primary production so like i mentioned earlier as we see 
uh, changes in where water falls on planet Earth. So some areas are going to get hotter and drier and some areas are going to get wetter. And, you know, like ice sheets and glaciers are going to melt faster or snowfall will be affected. Like there's so many aspects of a warmer planet and it's going to be far reaching in its consequences. So when we have like warmer uh, waterways, like I mentioned earlier, that may lead to an increase in like al algae growth may benefit, but then that has impacts on other species that the algae are like out competing or taking over. Or you may have less rainfall. If you have less rainfall, that's gonna mean less river flows. And if you have less water and less <laughs> fresh water entering into wetlands, like that's gonna be impacted. If you have um, uh, warmer temperatures in our oceans, that's gonna affect the coral reefs, which is a huge ho home to a third of fish species in our oceans. Um, if you look at the seasons changing, so we what we're finding is that the warmer season like is starting to happen earlier and last longer, and that has impacts on species that have evolved to live in like snowy environments. So this little fox right here uh, with its white fur coat, and uh, normally in decades past or years past, it'd still have snow on the ground. And so now this, this fox or whatever it is, I would actually have low fitness right now uh, because its phenotype no longer confers um, high fitness. And then you have like increased uh, forest fires and hot temperatures. And so obviously this is going to affect primary productivity and the plants in our ecosystems and then all of the trophic levels on top of that. And so oh, it's uh, a lot of threats to biodiversity. And uh, when we really think about it, can species evolve to um, keep up with these changes? So this video is a great explanation on some animal species that are adapting to climate change. So I highly recommend this TED Ed video. Uh, I show it in my classroom to my students. And then that leads us into the next discussion that in this changing environment, uh, just because it would be helpful for this rabbit to like have brown fur to live in a snow-free environment uh, doesn't mean that that is going to happen. So mutations are random and not directed by specific environmental pressures. So just because ecosystems are changing due to climate change, habitat loss, pollution, all the different ways we are disturbing our ecosystems, uh, it's very like quick amounts of change in a short amount of time. So populations, uh, whether or not they survive, really comes down to do they have genetic diversity? Do they have variations in phenotypes that can be selected for? If populations are declining because of maybe habitat loss, you're losing genetic diversity. And if a population does not have the variation to survive, well, then they're going to go extinct. And just because it would be nice for a mutation to happen to create new variation doesn't mean it's going to. And so when we talked about earlier, climate change, our one degree Celsius increase in 100 years is much faster than the thousand years that it normally would take to raise our Earth's temperature one degree Celsius. In that thousand year time scales, there's time for mutations to randomly occur and for variations to be selected for and for animals to evolve along with the rising temperatures. Now the change is happening so fast that species are struggling to keep up and that is why it is one of the top six contributors to extinction of our species and biodiversity on planet Earth. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and talk about the last or last couple parts. So here are some standards from College Board. So this at uh, part A uh, ties in with our discussion on invasive species. So we can see how certain diseases can devastate native species. And then the second part, habitat change can occur because of human activity. Uh, we've talked about global climate change having impacts on changing ecosystems, but also we saw logging and deforestation, urbanization and monocropping. So in my first video. So let's go ahead though and talk about Dutch elm disease and potato blight and how introducing diseases can devastate native species. Now I wanna mention smallpox, I'm just going to assume you learned about that in your U.S. history class, how Europeans brought smallpox to the Native Americans and that decimated uh, those human populations. So when we talk about though Dutch elm disease, this is actually an invasive species moving into um, elm trees and actually it's pretty widespread spread throughout Minnesota. It's an invasive species and it like is spread by little beetles that 
um, eat the bark and like are inside of the tree. And so therefore it wipes out whole populations. And so that is an invasive species. That's a disease actually, and uh, has negative consequences. Now we all hopefully learned, if you're a junior or senior, you learned in your US history class about the Irish potato famine, which caused a huge immigration to the US of Irish immigrants. And that's because they had one monoculture. So an ecosystem with low biodiversity and therefore a low resiliency to disturbance. So the potato blight is also a pathogen that wiped out potato crops. So from both of these examples, especially like this potato blight example, we can see how um, relying on just one species for a food source is actually um, not a good idea because if a, a fungus or a pathogen comes and attacks it, well then your whole entire food crop is wiped out. Right? So it's good to have high amounts of biodiversity, even in your crops and what you grow. And then our very last standard of the year talks about geological and meteorological events affecting habitat change and ecosystem distribution. So the three things mentioned from College Board are El Nino, continental drift, and the meteor impact on dinosaurs. So if we look at this GIF here on the left, obviously as the meteor struck planet Earth, it caused like a wide um reaching disruption in the atmosphere as far as like debris and blocking the sunlight and as you block the sunlight you can't do photosynthesis and it rippled through all the trophic levels and so um yeah that was very bad for habitats and ecosystems on planet earth 65 million years ago then if you look at my gift that i found on the internet you can see how as continents move across the planet their like solar intensity and where they're located like latitude wise on planet earth is going to change their abiotic factors such as rainfall temperature humidity levels and then that'll have an impact on the plant species that grow i believe i talked about this in my 8.2 video on energy flow through ecosystems. And so where the continents are found can shift um, the ecosystems found there. Like for example, there's actually fossils of tropical plants on Antarctica. And so uh, I also picked this GIF. I really liked how you can see how India formed and like collided into the Asian continent. And now that's like where Mount Everest and the Himalayan mountain range comes from. And then our last slide is about El Nino. And so um, El Nino is this unpredictable change. Like scientists have trouble predicting when an El Nino is going to happen. And they're not even entirely sure why it happens. But normally, if you look at that normal year section, we have a nice warm current um, traveling across the ocean towards Indonesia. That warm current of water brings a lot of moisture in the air, which then like rains down uh, as rain in the rainforest. Um, the same rainforest that we talked about in this topic, part, video part one, about the orangutans and habitat loss. Anyway, during an El Nino year, that current switches course and actually comes back towards South America instead and North America. And with it, it brings us warm uh, moisture as well as excess rain. And so during an El Nino year, the Pacific coast actually gets a lot of rain uh, and then Indonesia dries out. So changing where that rain falls is going to have an impact on ecosystems and habitats. I believe during the 1997, I think it was, um, El Nino event, uh, Indonesia actually dried out because the rain was all falling along the, the west coast here on North America and South America. And so Indonesia didn't get the rain they normally do, which caused a lot of like drying out conditions and led to a lot of forest fires and I think a lot of human deaths. So El Nino and where the rain falls and how hot or dry an area is um, can affect habitats. All right, all right, that is it. Great job. Uh, especially if you've watched all my videos all year. I'm super proud of you and you did it. Good job.